What, what, what has the vineyard taught you about life? Philosophical question. Yeah, let's start out with a little philosophy here, and then we'll get down to the dirt. Patience. In, in what way? You just have to watch what Mother Nature is going to do, and she has she works slowly and 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 in um, ways that you may not expect. I mean, it's like you have to just over the years see what, what what's going on out there. And, uh, and uh, so I've, it, it's taught me a lot of patience. I'm, I'm trying to like. Was there a particular lesson that that comes to mind? I think it's a cumulative thing. It's like I, I grew grapes in in, um, in Walnut Creek in California when I first got bitten by this crazy bug, and um, and then when I came up here, uh, I I found that I couldn't translate those things I was doing there to here. Because of the climate. The climate and everything soil. else. And I had a, um, a mentor. I met a fellow up here that was older than I was. Had 20,000 hours on caterpillar tractors when he was growing up as a kid. I mean, and he farmed a lot of wheat and, he, and then he, he also farmed hops and and he said something to me one day. He said, you know, Dick, this is like just, I don't know anything about grapes, but this is like hops. You know, they have, they have to be cut back every year, it's just like hops, and and then um, they get mildew like hops do, and and you have to deal with the climate in the same way. And it's, so it's an adaptation. You don't, you don't you grow whatever crop you grow. You have to adapt to that environment that's given you, and you just can't say I did it this way. Therefore, I'm going to it this way here. It's huge difference. Oh, yeah. yeah. You really saw that when I went to Europe in 77. I spent six weeks going through the vineyards of, 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 in uh, Burgundy and Chimney and, and uh, Alsace of Germany. And you see, they, they really farm to what the environment says it allows them to do. And then that way you come in harmony, I think. You, know, you find that that, uh, that harmony that uh, to the basically are, are one with, with, with what you're doing. Tell me what that means. It's like, you know, we hear that, you know, becoming one with nature and all that kind of stuff. And it, it's almost like a catchphrase, you know, starting from the hippies, you know, out of California uh, in the 60s. I think it means you don't try to force your way onto something. It, you know, you, you listen to, you know, obviously they don't talk, but you're, you, you're listening to what the divines are telling you and, 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 and you respond to that. Yeah. It's, uh, I've still learned stuff out in the vineyard. I've been doing what, what's, a, what's a recent something that you've learned? Um, I've been tr we've been trying different rootstocks out to, you know, because we got phylloxera here, and uh, well, I don't know how long we had it here, but it was um, confirmed in 1990 on uh, the next day over. And so, and we messing around with different kind of rootstocks uh, because we have a history of, of what rootstock is best to use, and, and finding out uh, that one rootstock doesn't behave like. They all, they all have they, they behave differently. It's and like devigorating and well, yeah, they with water and one somehow the, the, the root structure uh, is more at more, more on the surface of the ground more. Um, but they all influence the vegetative growth cycle of the cyan. And what's what's interesting, we still you know, we have we could see the vineyards. You'll see outside. You'll see where the rootstock vineyards are now. The, there won't be any leaves on there, but you still see some leaves in vineyards out here, and those will be on own rooted vines. The guys that have not, they, they, that there have no influence from rootstock, and it, what it says is that vinifera on its own roots is a fairly strong, long season growing situation where it doesn't you, because you can see what the influence of rootstock is shortening the, the cycle. What kind of difference does that make, in, you know, in the fruit? 
However, I think that it would come out a little bit earlier maturity on stuff on rootstock. Uh-huh. Um, I don't know where you know, <coughs> then you have to then then you, then you talk about the whole issue what is what's maturity in the first place. I mean, you, you can measure all the, chem, the chemical parameters of sugar and acid, but you can't measure the flavor parameters. That's, that's you know, how, what are what's the flavor development like in the fruit? Yeah. You know, it's, that's always interesting. This year, we had a lot of good flavor development and fairly low sugar content. Because of the cool right temperatures. Cool temperatures, and we got in that rain at the end of the season. It kind of knocked things back. Yeah. Uh, sugar wise, it knocked things back. And um, how, uh, you know, how did you like this year's harvest uh, in terms of the food flavor? Uh, it, it could have been better because we did suffer because of the rain. But you know, that's, that's Oregon. I mean, that's. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, if, if every year were the same here, it'd be pretty boring. I would be doing something else. You would have stayed in Walnut Creek. I would have stayed down there. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it is sort of like every year is a different year. It's sort of like, you know, when, and it, when I remember Ansel Adams talking about uh, uh, photography, and he would talk about the negative as. The, the, the score to the music, and, uh-huh. the, and the, as the print as the performance, and it, it's kind of like the same thing every every you know with with, with grapes. You have every, every year you have this Mother Nature gives you this negative like okay you've got this these grapes you know in this and here's what you've got to work with and then you take it into the winery and then now you that becomes the performance. Uh-huh. So you're saying like uh, the, uh, the the winemaker is like a photographer in, in the in the dark room? Yeah, he has, he he can take the, the, the fruit <laughs> in it. He can he can burn it a little bit here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so and it. dodge it over here a little yeah, bit. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, that was one of the questions I was going to ask you. Is like, you know, what's the role of the winemaker? Uh, you know, what is the winemaker? What's the influence of the winemaker? Well, he's, he's, he's interpreting that fruit as it came in into, into a style that he has somehow, you know, vision in, in, his, in his brain about how this, based on what the, how the grapes tasted when they came in, where he wants to go with them, take what, what kind of path he wants to take with them. Okay, so then he, he's got the negative. The negative, you know, is the fruit that, that nature has given you. Okay, yeah. here, here's the all, all the context on that negative. Yeah. And he might want to emphasize this side of the negative or this side of the negative, what you know, he wants to do with it. Nice analogy. <laughs> good job. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think it's a good analogy. Yeah. Um, what about like the differences when you went to France, you know, to Burgundy and to Chablis and, and the different areas? Uh, what did you see different there than uh, than you see here? You know, it's like I'm, I'm looking at, you know, it's like uh, tradition. I'm looking at um, culture. Uh, um, Looking also maybe at soil, climate. Um, well, definitely when you go to Europe and go to those regions, they've been growing grapes for so many hundreds of years that they're really steeped in their culture on and their mental, I think their whole view of what they're doing, uh, which in a way is if, 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 you, if, if you've learned everything there is about growing grapes, that's probably a good thing. But if there's some things out there you haven't learned, not that's it. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, you kind of got a closed end thing. You're not going to try. You're not going to try, to try to anything new. Uh, I think that's where you know in, in the United States where we have a little bit of an advantage is that we're not we're not stuck in a, s- a situation that says you can't try something else. You know? Yeah. And and so, but what I saw over there is that I you know I just. That was 1977, and only had I started planting up here in '72 of my first vintage. So um, when I went over there, I saw that they used these uh, movable catch wires to hold the, the shoots up and things. Like, we never thought of that in California because it's the last, it's the last thing you wanted to do because uh, with the, all that light and heat, you would you want to actually have some kind of a canopy that would shade the fruit a little bit to protect it from sunburn. Well, in, in Europe, you don't have that issue, neither do you in Oregon. You don't have a sunburn issue here. So you, you, so we ended up bringing back that concept and, of, of movable catch wires, and we em, employed that in 1978 and started putting them in the vineyards. Um, and then, 
and, and the wineries uh, know how to handle. Pinot Noir is a d- tough grape to handle. It's, it's T- tough in what way? Well, it's so delicate. I mean, the flavors are, are not. They don't. It isn't. A, it isn't a grape that's going to hit you with a sledgehammer. And you know, it like like it doesn't have a strong dominant uh, flavor profile. One single thing that says, "Oh, I." You know, Cabernet tastes like Cabernet when we, we grow it in. In, in eastern Washington or here in the Willamette Valley. I mean, it tastes like Cabaret. and a big range of climate differences. There. Where Pinot is like, it doesn't, it, it, it's very more specific on, it, in, unto its whole terroir, what it, how it's being grown. You know, the, it doesn't like really hot days, it doesn't like, doesn't like cold nights. It doesn't like to have a uh, hot sun beat on it in the afternoon so an east slope is better than a west slope. You know, and it, it has, other thing, other grape varieties don't seem to be bought. They don't care that that much, and that's, it make, that's what makes it. You know, and then it's and it, the whole idea of making the wine is is to is not to uh, until you get fermentation going, not not to even to beat it up at all. I mean, just like trying to get the berries off the clusters with the least effort as possible without bruising the fruit. I mean, it's it's it's, it's it is. And, then, and then and then to get it. You know, it doesn't like rainfall. Rain, it, you know, it's, it doesn't like it at all. So it, it has it many different. Uh, it's more fragile. It's like a. That's why you call it feminine. You know? uh, um, and I also, it's, 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 it, but it's you know, it's very in, a lot of. It's always interesting to make it. <laughs> I have two questions on that. On that, it's like, um, how would you? Is there an analogy, or uh, what would you compare Pinot, the, the, the fruit, to? Can you think of anything else? I mean, I've heard it uh, compared to a lot of different kinds of things. What would you compare it to? I mean, within the grape family, or outside of the outside family? of the family? Out, yeah, what, you what know, it's like you oh, yeah. the, the negative uh, yeah. uh, comparison. You know, and I'm just trying to. Uh, what else can we compare the, the Pinot, the, the fruit? We have to handle. Peaches. Peaches. <laughs> <laughs> you look at a peach cross eye, then it bruises, right? Yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah. Uh, you have a mildew problem, and, and, and the, the curly leaf, and the, yeah. You know, so. yeah, it's um. <laughs> the peaches are getting hot, though. <laughs> yeah, it's um. You know what's very interesting about wine is. Uh, is that it's one of the, the few things in, in our society that when, t- when we talk about it, we describe it in terms of something else. Uh-huh. You know, we don't say this tastes like Pinot Noir. We say, oh, this has got this, this cherries. I get cherries. I get raspberries. I get, you know, it's got tropical this. It's got this spicy this and that. You know, it's a little, all these different things. But we never say, oh, well, it tastes like Pinot. Yeah. It looks like this tomato tastes like a tomato, right? <laughs> Well, why is that? I mean, where, where, where's that, that comparison come from? Well, I think it's because the the grape is is um, multi uh, dimension in terms of how it tastes. It, 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 it's almost like a it's it's p- picking up its environment and bringing in different flavors depending how it was grown and what the weather was like that yeah, year. Yeah, strawberries. I mean, I, I've never seen strawberries out in a vineyard. I mean, so where's yeah. getting the strawberries? I mean, they're down in the valley, yeah, you know, so, fifty so miles away. Or what's a, miles where's away. the strawberry flavor come yeah, from? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's that. It's you know, and then it's just look at the number of varieties of wine that you have when you go into a store, and like five hundred different kinds of grapes are being grown commercially in the world. Five hundred. Five hundred. Yeah. Uh, you know, probably minimum. I mean, yeah, I've even you, heard like ten thousand. Yeah, but, but commercially, you know, uh-huh. commercially, probably about five hundred. Yeah. And so you don't have 500 different kinds of carrots being grown. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. It depends on who's marketing them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all about uh, grapes. And, 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 and then um, other varieties, you know, like white Riesling, which does very well here, uh-huh. does very well in eastern Washington. It does. I have neighbors in Arizona. It does well down there. It, 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 does, it doesn't have this real tight uh, band of growing conditions that it, it likes. It, it'll, it'll, it'll accommodate much wider band of growing conditions. So where Pinot has this narrow band 
you know, it's sort of like a flat, he's, he's, he's showing a flashlight across the landscape, and only one place did it light up, you know, uh -huh. and that's where Pino is, where you, you shine it, with, with, you can take, you know, Cabernet or Riesling, and it'll light up all over, you know. Yeah, yeah. So why is that? I wonder, like, isn't Pino, um, as I recall, like, it's a pretty old... Yeah, it's, it goes back. It, it's probably one of the oldest varieties known because it goes back into Burgundy, which goes back way into the, in the first what, 200 uh, A.D. something like that, 300 A.D. They, 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 they're not even sure how the grape got there. Yeah. Because this whole notion of Hannibal taking grapes across the Alps uh, doesn't really figure because he was going in the summertime when he could cross the Alps and he couldn't take grapevines in the summer with him, and it, you know, they would have to take dormant cuttings. And eat. So, you know, they, they have found seeds of different grapes in old caves in, in, in France, and, and uh, they were prehistoric, you know. So there was some kind of native vine growing there way before you know, um, modern history. Yeah. You know, and, and how we were and you know, what came to come out of that. Yeah, so it's kind of nebulous back there. Yeah. Getting back to like what the vineyard is taught you, one of the things you said was patience. What, what are the kind of things, you know, is it taught you about life in general? It's like, you know, when you walk away from the vineyard, you say, oh, this is a good lesson for me to deal with people, or to deal with business, or to deal with... Um, I think that you you have to be you have to really be honest with yourself. You can't fool the grapes, you know. They can't talk back to you, but you know, they, it's. Uh, I always think in in life, there's integrity is really important, and uh, and you can't be bullshitting the grapevines. I mean, you got to do what they're they're asking you to do. You can't force your way on them. Um, you you know, you see what you they have a comment. There's a some mutual ground that you know, obviously they want to be taken care of because if you, if you don't, they go nuts and you'll never, you'll never get much fruit. And, you know, but it, and, uh, so that translates into the life. Uh, the integrity. Yeah, the integrity. Uh, the, whole, honest, the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. No bullshit in the vine. Huh? Yeah, no <laughs> Yeah, I like it. <laughs> 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 Out of here. <laughs> 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 kind of, then they become like errant teenagers or something like that. Yeah. Their own way. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's what everyone asks what, what are clones like. You know, we have all these different mutations going on. Like, you know, eight in the family. You know, you you got the good ones and bad ones. <laughs> <laughs> They're all yours, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you know, that's you know, some clones be are better behaved than others. You know? <laughs> I've never even thought that. Way. So uh, like seven seven six and Pomar, uh, like they're brothers, but uh, yeah, uh, yeah. They, they they have they like they have their different uh, different traits, you know. Uh huh. Yeah. Some like to stay out late at night. And <laughs> 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 uh, yeah. So you have to learn what those traits are before you put them in the ground, huh? Well, you, hopefully you know. <laughs> yeah. 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 What did you sell your first bottle of wine for? What did I sell it for? Yeah. Um, I think we were selling uh, the whites for $5 a bottle. And I think the Pinot was sold for 7 bucks, maybe seven fifty, something like that. It's been a long time. We used to sell it off of a card table in our in the our first winery was in the basement of the house, and uh, up where the yeah, where the uh -huh. and 
when I built the house, I knew I was going to make wine in the basement, so I, I had big doors and drains and stuff so I could do that. And then when we started, but I didn't, we didn't have a tasting room. Yeah. So it was like on, okay, we open up on weekends and people would come up and taste wine. We had a card table sitting there and, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> cash box. <laughs> you know, that's the way it started. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, I used to uh, write down in a, in a little book like that, you know, about this size and what we sold today, you know. Is that right? Yeah. Um, give me like a like a, a two minute, and I'm going to time you. Like a two minute uh, version of like the sirens that called you to Oregon wine. Mm. Like a, just kind of like a little minute. When did you first hear the call? And what, you know, what, what, what was that? Defining moment, but it started. It starts back when I was in California, and and. Uh, Started making wine in Rose Creek first in '5, and up until one or so wine with them Thanksgiving or Christmas in the house. And, uh, so when I got interested in making wine, I started asking questions about wine. Mm-hmm. Where did it all come from? How it how has it come to pass? And, and uh, about that same time, I had a friend who uh, was much more advanced in, in, in wine than I was at the time, and and, and he introduced me to, to Pinot Noir at, at a dinner at his house. Huh. And, well, this is really good stuff. You know, and, uh, how do, you do, you remember, do you remember who made that? It was Engel in 1955. Is that right? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I still remember the <laughs> <laughs> It was a California Pinot, you know, and, uh, but it was made in the old days, and it was, it was pretty... Really, I mean, as I recall, I mean, maybe today I wouldn't say it was so good, but yeah. at least I thought it was really good then. And so that that sent me on the hunt: to where can I, you know, grow Pinot in California? And it and uh, I was in electronics, and I had to figure out how to take care of a system, begin family, and at the same time do the do the great thing. So I was looking in in the Anderson Valley, which was at the time no one had planted grapes there yet. I thought it was a cool spot and I knew that Pinot needed a cool area. And then the Santa Cruz Mountains I could maybe work in electronics was close by, but then Santa Cruz Mountains was nothing but a big pile of rock, so that didn't was not, not you know the amount of the sites there weren't that great. So also it was very expensive even back then because it was, it was so close to the Bay Area. The um, then I wanted to take a course at, at Davis about making wine, uh, and where I met a lot of other winemakers with a, with a refresher course for people in the industry. And I was my way into this course. And I had guys like Andre Chelichev and Louis Martini who were my classmates. So we were learning just as much from the classmates as we were from the professors. And, and one of the professors, I was talking to one of uh, Vern Singleton, who retiring now, and yeah, they're having an honor for him in this the next meeting of the SEV, but long story short, as I'm talking to, to Vern Singleton, and I'm saying, well, what, what's going on in the Pacific Northwest? I mean, I was a, when I was a kid, I was in Europe for a little bit, and it, it was, uh, and I, I also lived in Seattle for a couple of years, and, you know, it seems like, more, to me, the climate, and without studying it, it seems the climate of Oregon and Washington could be more like northern France and, and southern Germany than California is, you know. Yeah. And he said, you know, uh, you should talk to the guy in the back of the classroom here. He's from Oregon. <laughs> 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 and it was Richard Summers Summer. from Rope. From Ro- uh-huh. and, uh, and so he expressed my Oregon. He made a bottle of wine. <laughs> he, he, he made, you know. Uh-huh. So he was already making wine. He planted, uh, I think, in 63. And um, so I, I couldn't wait to get this bottle of wine back to Walnut Creek and try it. And I pull out the cork and I pour the wine. And it just smells like whiskey. Like whiskey, whiskey, and, and what was it? What well, it was, it, what, it, what, it, what it was was a, uh, uh, it was a, I think it was a cabernet that he made. But what he did was he, he was, he, he didn't have much money, so he was getting freshly emptied whiskey barrels from Hood River Distilleries. Oh, he was empty, <laughs> so, and he wasn't even bothering washing his mouth because he, he wanted to get the extra little hit from the whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> so the wine went right in. Of course, it smelled like whiskey, you know. But <laughs> behind, 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 
but behind all that, I could say there's some really nice fruit character there. You know? so, uh -huh. so, and then it so happens that Tektronics had offered me a job here in, in Beaverton that fall, and uh, so I, I drove up uh, during uh, the World Series, which was back then, it was the first couple weeks in October, uh -huh. and I, 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 I drove the family car up about 80 miles an hour, and I <laughs> did, and then, and then by that time, I also, Vern Singleton told me that he had two guys in his class from the previous year, Dave Lett and Chuck Curry, that had come up to Oregon, so Dave Lett was all selling textbooks when I went by his house, but Chuck Curry was at home up before I drove, and so he's... We, we, I think we stayed up like four o'clock in the morning just talking about this thing, and I and I was, you know, I, I was by that time I was thoroughly ignited, you know, I was I was ready to go. On that. Uh -huh. And he convinced you that it was okay to do it here. Yeah, he also had a, a master's thesis that he did was which uh, was was about the climate and why you, the different climate um, and there's a, there's a whole you know, there's, there's books that probably stack ten feet high on what it takes to grow grapevine people have done over the years and and in 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 that in those books they're there they talk about the requirements the, the heat requirements the the the, the, the water and all, all these different parameters that you need uh, and then and then in California they had what they called the degree day system so many degree days you could plant this and that and different well that was a, that's a very coarse way of looking at it so and the, what Chuck did is we more fine more finely tuned the whole system and uh, and and grew from other researchers the different different uh, uh, justification for what he, what, he was, what he was saying and so that's why he was convinced that Oregon was right the right place and the notion there is that you have a growing window in time and the best wines always come when you fit that growing window as best you can, not when it gets, when you, obviously if you don't fit it, you never get them right, but if you also, if it gets too hot, they get ripe too early and you, you can't get the flavor development. So you're trying to fit this, this window. And with trouble with Pinot, it's got a very narrow window where it like, seems like we like we talked about earlier, have a wider window. So this, it really fits that narrow window. And so, um, and so in 77, when I went to, went to Burgundy, and uh, I had um, going to the small producers and tasting their wines, and I took and I take the thief and pull the wine out of the barrel and we taste the wine, and uh, and it just it thought, it struck me that said I got wine like this at home that smells like this. And it tastes huh. like this is very similar, folks. You know? Yeah. And I, then I knew then uh, that that was that were that was the confirmation of doing the right thing. Yeah. Huh. So then it's just after that, it's a matter of just getting it done. And so that that was like you you um, you were making your own wine, and, and it uh, had similar flavors. Yeah, you could, the, the family resemblance was there. With, you know, uh, this this belongs to the right. Yeah. We're you know we're all in the we're in the you know we're in the same ballpark, and we got you know we got we got the same team. We're hitting the ball out of the park. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, we're gonna hit it out of the park. One of the things that you know, like, what was the culture like when uh, uh, when you like started the the, the wine industry, the, the, the culture? Um, there's there's just a handful of us. Yeah. And we all. What was unique about Oregon wines, and it still is, I think, that people came here to raise the grapes because they have they wanted to have that that climate factor. That would produce great world-class Pinot Noirs. It isn't like I woke up some day, woke up, you know, and looked out my window and said, "Well, I'm only 20 miles from San Francisco, and I know they drink a lot of wine there. I better plant some grapes." It's <laughs> <laughs> good marketing, though. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's when you, when you look back on it. That's probably where a lot of California wine industry got started around the Bay Area, you know, but, you know and, and 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 but you know, obviously there's there good growing conditions around the Bay Area, so. Those early, those early years, we we were we would meet like once a month, and we shared information. There was a lot of collaboration going on, and there still is. I mean, the, because the learning curve here is very steep, long and short time. Yeah. You know, one, uh, one point four billion dollars now. 
Yeah, maybe. What, yeah, yeah. what about, can you remember like any of those early things? I mean, uh, did you drink a lot of wine or? CK Mandavi. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't afford our own wines. <laughs> we didn't have any. <laughs> we had, no, we, we, we went and we met at the Tigard Fire Hall and because they let us use the, the fire hall for our meetings and and uh, we bring a couple jugs of CK Mandavi and some Safeway French bread and and some Tillamook cheese and that was our that was our, you know, our, our, our libation that we had our meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and what was the mood like you know, at these meetings in the libations period after we kind of described the mood? I think we, we all, I don't, can't think of one particular meeting, but um, there was all, um, everyone was jovial, everyone was positive. Um, when, we, when we perceived there to be a problem, we would go after it. I mean, we, 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 uh, early on in 1970, we, had, uh, we said, gosh, we, we really need to have clean virus-free stock to plant here because it was short growing season we have, you can't have viruses that you tend to interfere with ripening. So you don't want to bring in infected stock. It doesn't make any difference in the place where you have a long growing season. Uh, as a matter of fact, it might be beneficial. It might actually drag out the problem of ripening. Um, so we had a quarantine pass that had to have a virus freeze. And that. You know, it was about three or four of us got that done. And we went to the legislature and said in 1972, I think it was, that you know we need. Uh, it was great. There's a built potential here in Oregon for for grapes, but what we really like to do is do a phenological study to see where the best places for the best varieties were. And so they actually got involved with that. We had tax blocks in, in different parts of the state with a broad range of varieties from very early ripening to late ripening ripening in both white and reds and to see how they would do. Some of the plots are still around. I mean, it was, it was under finance at the time. We had a lot of money, but basically we got the university on board that way and now Oregon State University is putting together a wine board, an Oregon wine board that will actually be there to support the industry. So I want us to do that. Oh, wine. Okay. And we, we have the wine board already. Yeah. Now, but yeah. there's going to be an Oregon Wine Institute inside of inside of Oregon State University. I don't know if you know about that or not. No, and so that's... Oregon Wine Board. It's Oregon Wine Institute, and it's uh, it's being, I think it's got about $2 million worth of funding. Who's, who's heading that up? Uh, well, the, it, it's, uh, we're getting four people, I think eight Four people from the horticultural side, four people from the, the food sciences side, so a total of eight staff people from OSU. And then there is a, uh, um, there'll be a uh, executive director that the industry will hire. And we're going to do a little bit differently than other, than in the past. And then we'll be able to have an industry, a non, uh, you know, a, a, what should I have? Uh, non, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A non non university person is going to uh -huh. oversee it. Okay. So now we have more of a business approach to like how what we're going to do, and here here's a list of projects that we like to have done, and what kind of timeline are we going to need, and what kind of funding are we going to take to get to, to, to make that happen? Yeah. Instead of trying to try crazy research. I mean, there have been times at, at Oregon State where they're trying to make wine out of milk way. Yeah, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I, was like, I wonder if any of that stuff's still around. I'd like to try it. <laughs> yeah. Did you ever try any of that? I think, well, there was uh, Hoya Wang. Uh, mm -hmm. He was a... <laughs> Well, I mean, he got the money. See, someone gave him, the, the milk industry gave him money, right? Oh, so it, oh that's who gave him the money. Yeah, to oh, do the research. So, so how can we ferment this stuff, you know? <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I know there's not a, a lot of that on the market just yet. No. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's waiting for the right time, right? Yeah, the right marketer. <laughs> I mean, that, that was going to have to be marketed. Yeah. That's funny. Acquired taste there on that one. Yeah. Now, 
what kind of differences are there now in that, that wine industry culture? I mean, we've got a lot of different um, things coming in. We've got even like uh, people coming in with money. We've got even big corporations, you know, PERS coming in. Uh, you know, CalPERS, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, California. It's, yeah, it's changing. So what, sure. what, what kind of what kind of difference does that make? What uh, you know, what, what's changing? Or what uh, you know, when you look out there, you know, in the vineyards? Well, the, the, the people are uh, have now adequate. There's no, we were all underfunded, undercapitalized when we first started. I mean, because we, what we didn't have in the way of, of money, we made up in with passion. I think. Passionate, you know, the commitment to do something. Um, I think the state has pretty much now proven that this is a good place to grow Pinot, you know? mm-hmm. and so now, you, now, it it, uh, it is not a risk, not a high risk situation for someone to come in and establish themselves here. You know, you still have to know where to plant and, um, and that sort of thing. But you know, given they have the resources to to do this, so I think that's just the next evo- next step in the evolution of coming to a mature mature business. Uh, the pioneering good. side is gone. I, th- I mean, it's over. I don't need anymore. I mean, pioneering is done. Yeah. You know, there might be some places still that in the state that you know with, with global warming um, or climate change, whatever you want to call it, uh, they're they're could be some places that we need to look that we have didn't look before. Yeah. You know, Southwest Washington. I think we might people should start looking maybe a little bit harder over on the other side of the river. You know, like in up by Battleground, up that way, huh. in the center area up there. There's been some vineyards up there in the past, but you know, there's nothing really strong going on there. Yeah. You know, all the stuff in Washington is based on the east side. So you think? Um, you know, like France, like the wine industry in France has been around for you know quite a few centuries. Can you look out into the future and see the Oregon wine industry, you know, lasting for centuries? It should. I mean, given what, what gives you that idea? That um, well, I think we're getting to be a, a nation that that uh, is demanding uh, better food. I mean, uh, hopefully, that the notion of slow food is. Is something that's here to stay. I mean, obviously McDonald's. Those guys are always thought it'd be great to drive to McDonald's and get a glass of. <laughs> yeah. Think of it. <laughs> dollar for the hamburger, four dollars for the glass of wine. I think. <laughs> and there's always the always issue of drinking and driving too. So, but yeah. so don't do it at the drive-thru. Yeah, yeah. I have to come in. Huh? Yeah, yeah, right. Um. And there's a breathalyzer at that door. <laughs> um, you know, I, I look back at the days when Julia Child first started in this country, and what a revolution that what we're now, what what she started now is everywhere. When I moved to Oregon in Portland, came in what '67. There were maybe two, three good restaurants in Portland, and now you can't you can't go to all of them. There's so many of them. And, and, and because that's happening, the wine thing goes hand in glove with that. And as long as that continues, I think you're, we'll be in good shape. One of the things I think about is like in France, it's like those guys have been doing it for so long. It's like, you know, this plot of land has this, you know, this family has been doing this little plot of land for, for a long time. Yeah. And, you know, things don't change very much. You know, and I think about America, and I think about influences and the changes that happen here. Like money changes things a lot, you know, here. And so that's why I kind of, you know, look out to the future and wonder what, the, you know, what the, what the wine industry here in Oregon is going to look like. I think it, I, it's still a great place for the small producer. Like Burgundy has a lot of small producers. Yeah. And it's, and, and, and the Burgundy model, I think, works here because they have also the large large producers, the negotiants that buy from a lot of places and have their own own vineyard in addition. It should work. So you think it'll be around for at least 100 I'll years? I'd be very disappointed if I come back in 100 years and it's not here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
We'll drive up the road and we'll recognize the place. Yeah. There'll be prune orchards yeah. or walnut orchards yeah. again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Boy, you have a nice view uh, uh, from up here. Yeah. Well, now you can see out the window and look at those things that I was telling you about. run out of gas pretty soon so you know I, I don't know it's like I mean uh, <laughs> that's why we have to send soldiers overseas I guess you know to find that gas uh, source um, one of the things I'm kind of curious about it's like I don't know if many people think about like vineyards and flowers and flowering and so I wanted to get from you it's like what does it smell like like in the vineyard when uh, you know like oh, flowering. When, the, when the flowering is going on yeah. it's it's uh, and it's a short period. It's a short period, and when they're and you get up around a fifty percent bloom and on up, it's just it's this intense. It's almost like a smell of a lemon tree blooming. It's a very oh, it's very uh, seductive bl- uh, aroma. Uh, it, seductive. Yeah, seductive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's it's uh, what is it? It's their all. It's, it's floating around up in there, and it's like it's uh. And I, you know, when you, when you think about it, it takes a lot of little flowers to do <laughs> that. <laughs> <laughs> and they're tiny. I mean, like, how big would you say, like, one of those flowers was? Oh, they're less than a 64th of an inch across, you know. Yeah, so that's like, um, there's, there's like a pencil, uh, pencil lead kind of size. Yeah, smaller than that. When you think of cluster of grapes, about, you know, uh, is uh, like the size of a lemon, and there's like 100 different berries on there, and every berry had five, well, I have one flower, uh, so you have a hundred little flowers in that little spa- space, you know, or more. You know, yeah, so. yeah. What, um, you know, it's like one of the, the, the changes that's happened here that, that surprised a lot of people, and I, I, ha- I have to ask, is like, you know, when, when St. Michelle offered to, to buy your, your winery, what was, what, you know, can you share like your thought process in that? I actually, you know, since I, my two sons aren't is- interested in taking the, taking over the winery, and uh, I had to figure out some way to transition the winery, and I, wa- I, I wanted to leave some kind of a legacy. I figured I wanted to have someone that would own it that could take the name the name forward, and I think I, and I actually had uh, uh, other interested parties going back to '97. By the winery, but I didn't feel that that they were were the best f- fit for me. And then uh, when Saint Michel uh, sh- <laughs> showed interest, and I, I, uh, I, you know, I've known their winemakers. I know I mean, Andre Chelichev was consulting for them back in the '70s, and, and he had experience with them. And, and I always thought they they ran a good ship up there, and uh, that they they. Um, they honor the uh, the notion of the individual wineries keeping its identity, and and so it's still it's like a, it's like the Shalom Group in California, where they have like six or seven different wineries, but they're all operating in, with their own winemaker and, and do and continue the style of wine that, that we've been producing all along. So that it, it made a lot of sense to a lot of sense to me, and and um, I still I know I didn't want to get fully retired, so I ended. I kept the, the vineyards here so I can, and I sell the grapes to, to them on, on a contractual basis, so work, work, working out good for me. So that's a good deal yeah, for you yeah, then, yeah. 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 So, um, the, uh, now I have to run out grapes in there. You know what amazes me is that you know out there, oh, and yeah. it's like the oldest, the, the, and, and that's what they're telling us there, is the oldest vineyards in the United States cultivated vineyards were in New Mexico, or the first ones, when the Spanish uh, missionaries came over. <clears throat> Apparently, you know, it's like they needed their um, uh, sacramental wines, yeah. and so they, you know, sh- to call to Spain, but, you know, it takes two years for them to get over here, and they said, well, forget this. It's like, let's just grow our own. And so, like, there were some, uh, uh, you know, vines planted for that. Well, I know that the, uh, the territorial... Governor House in Santa Fe is the oldest c- 
continuing. Continu it was built in 15 something, and it's still being used today. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 You think nothing about yeah. You think not Washington D.C. You know, it's Santa Fe, New Mexico. Yeah. Not wasn't didn't belong to us though. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was reading um, too, like you know, like I was trying to trace back like the early history of, of wine in here. You know, uh, way pre uh, prohibition. Oh, and yeah. apparently, um, I read somewhere where the guys from Fort Vancouver, uh, like they would come up into this area up in here, and apparently some vineyards at that time, you know, in those early 1800s, were planted in this area here. And someone said that they even found like bottles and even traces of vineyards. Now, I have no idea how they find traces of vineyards, mm. um, but that's what these guys were... Um, you know, we're saying. I was wondering if you had heard anything about that. Um, there is a. I still have it upstairs somewhere. There was a, a pamphlet that came out in 1914 from the Oregon School of College of Agriculture. It's, it, it's what now where OSU is now. It, it was in, out of Monmouth. I have it upstairs. I'll see if I can dig it out for you. And they talk about who was growing grapes here and what what their, uh, what their experiences were and how they. And there's some photographs in there, and, uh, and but none of the grapes that they were growing were uh, wine grapes, except one called Sweetwater. Sweetwater. Sweetwater is is is, a, is actually a Chasla de Rey, like a variety that grows all through Europe. It makes it makes uh, uh, the Swiss uh, Dole wine and uh, on the slopes by the Lake Zurich. Huh. Uh, it's the dome. It's a white wine, it's, and it's very neutral. Uh, it doesn't taste like much of anything. And I was over there one time, and I kind of tried to do this dip diplomatically, and said, "Why are you growing a grape that doesn't taste like anything?" <laughs> <laughs> so it's just like drinking water, then. <laughs> very light, you know, very light, and it, that because it's it, they have all these uh, huh. all these perch that come out of the lakes. Uh huh. And they're 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 very light white you know white flesh. Oh, okay. They're very light and they're very delicate flavored fish. So they, they, they the wine goes with the fish. So rather than contrast, yeah, yeah, it doesn't they overpower the fish. Oh, okay, well. Yeah, so there's a reason for everything. You know, you have to dig deep enough. Yeah, yeah. And oh, what the interesting thing was is that one of the vineyards I have is called Niederberger's on Niederberger Road, and Fritz Niederberger is still alive. All his health is failing. He. Uh, he has this big uh, ponderosa pine in his front yard, and it's huge. And I said, Fritz, how old is that, that tree? And he said, well, when I got here in 1922, it was about this high, you know? Wow. And, and, <laughs> and when his family moved there in 1922, there had already been a family orchard there on the place, and they must have had grapevines. Because, huh. because it, well, you can see there's an old some old apple tree and up in the corner that is now off it's kind of like part of the underground and like their dug firs are growing there you know what they are and then the poison oak is growing there and all of a sudden I see grapevine is coming out of the poison oak wow. and, and I'm looking at this grapevine and it has uh, it had a few grapes on it I couldn't tell what they were uh, the leaf was not looking like a labrusca leaf to me so it was a lot, there were a lot of conkers and, and it, knows that, that when they did plant grapes here in the 19, 20, 10, 12, and most of them were conquered varieties of Labrusca type that make not very good wine. Right? Yeah. But they didn't get mildew or anything, so that's probably why they had them. Um, they were tough, and you just grew them and let them go, you know, didn't have uh -huh. to do much to do with them. But they had this one called Sweetwater, so, uh -huh. and I said, and so I, 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 one year, a few years ago, we took some cuts off of it went down in our vineyard down here and grafted it onto a, a big mature vine. I just cut the heads off uh -huh, uh -huh. and graft it. And, and it's, it turns out to be his chasselet de Rey. And it's, yeah. Huh. Yeah, and it's growing in here. So it's probably some of the first great vine material that ever came in Oregon. Wow. Yeah. So there's still that, some vines yeah, so out there underneath the poison oak or yeah, the blackberries. Yeah, growing wild. Probably ought to take some, take some cutting and set it to the germ plasma, you know, some place to keep the, the genetic uh, uh, data, you know. Huh, that's pretty interesting. Yeah. Huh. 
and, and like I'm, I'm, I'm kind of trying to find like, you know, like quote the first vines, uh, you know, just so I can yeah. photograph. Uh, well, I think the first vine that I saw when I that that time when I came up and interviewed with Tektronics and spent that evening at Chuck Curry's place on out on David Hill. The, vine, yeah, yeah, we yeah. Used to call it Wine Hill in the old days, and. My boss in Shell Development Company, when I was my first job going out of school, I worked for Shell Development. My boss, Don Caples, had, had went to uh, was studying to be a, an, uh, an eye surgeon, and they taught I. That's one of the, at the school. What's the name of the school in the course? Um, Pacific, 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 Pacific. 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 Yeah, I know what you mean. And he was going there at the time. And that's what it was like, and he was. Don would be alive would have been probably about 90 now so and he was in in the old days getting people would go from Hillsboro or Portland in a horse and buggy and get in and, and take the horse and buggy out to work and, mm-hmm. and there was the old uh, Rooters uh, vineyard up there which is now where Chuck Corey's place was but across the street on the other side and I don't think it's there anymore. When I saw it in the '67, there were there were Concord vines, and there was there was also uh, Sweetwater, and I mean the trunks were like this. They're big old gnarly. Oh, yeah. there, there and big. that's across. Like I'm trying to picture yeah, where go, that is. Like go, um, it would be like to the north, or where, where is it? Rooters, you go up to where Curry's place is, and you come back a little bit ways towards Forest Grove, and on the right hand side, there was a little bowl there. And I, the last time I was up there, which is maybe seven, seven years ago, there I don't think they were there anymore. You know, I'm I trying think to think there's an area that's kind of cleared. Um, there, there's a house at the very end of the clearing, um, and there's kind of a clearing. And it, it's, it's, as I recall, it's relatively steep. Yeah, um, yeah it was steep. In, in that area. Yeah, it was a steep little slope, and I would imagine when I, when I saw it, it wouldn't be more than an acre or so. Yeah, it, yeah. Yeah, not very big. And there were vines here. Huh, I'm going to look the next one out there. Uh, it's like that David Hill has so much history, uh, you know, yeah, and the guy that bought it, you know, now. Um, Who owns it now? Oh, after, after um, it's a David, guy. Well, David Teppel has sold it, right? Yeah, and, and he's the who, guy, he just, he just wanted to, you know, it's just kind of a curiosity. He's not so much into it. He's got a winemaker and stuff, and they're making wine. Huh. You know, it's just a, a real nice historic spot. Yeah, yeah. Huh. You know, with the, with the house and stuff. I gotta check my list of things that I should uh, be asking you. Hey, um, like in, in your history of winemaking and in, in, in the vineyard, what was the most difficult time? Uh, you know, like the single most difficult moment that oh, you had? Oh, so. There was in 19 when I when I bought the first uh, vineyard site in 1968. And which site was that? Off Upper Road, uh-huh. What's it called now? I called it Chairman. I had it. And now I think the guys that own it now just call it. I'm not sure what they have. I think they want to call it Chayelm Vineyard, but they have a problem with the winery Chayelm because that's the name too. Yeah. They don't think they had registered and so on and so forth. I don't know what they're calling it. Um, do you have that map of the all the yeah. vineyards yeah. in Daniel County? It's on there. And, that, uh, and I mean, you might not even see a name on it on the map. In any event, that was a um, that was thirty some odd acres of walnuts on that place when I bought it from Mrs. Dobb. And um, so the first thing I had to do was is um, get rid of the walnut trees, and I had a guy come in and shove them over, and then then I put an ad in the Tektronics newspaper, free firewood, and the guys came out and. A lot of weekends, it was like a Korean battlefield out there. <laughs> <laughs> like Ten million chainsaws all going at the same time. <laughs> but, <laughs> that was 1968 was a year when it rained like six inches of rain in August, and that's oh, when the wow. pole, the pole bean business went out of business because. They, they should stick those 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 stakes in, and they have the, the string mm-hmm. and a couple wires and the string, and then they only go in the ground about that far, and with the, all that moisture and the wind, they all fell over. So so that that you could buy. That's that's how all this. When we first started planting grapevines, we bought the bean stakes for a penny a piece, and we bought the wire for a penny a pound or something. I mean, wow. they, I, there were some guys who were, they were so upset. They said. 
take it. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Oh, so, what a heartbreak. Yeah. yeah. For them. And then th- then that's the same August I'm I'm putting a, a, a little road in to get up to the top of the hill and the ground is so wet I just keep putting in pit run and pit run and load after load to get anything. of of gravel too. But yeah. it was big heavy stuff to get in to have us you know, we put you know, there's so much pit run in that road you you could put <laughs> <laughs> a, lot, a lot of semi over it, now, you know. So then, then uh, you know, I'm, I'm from California, and it rains like hell in Oregon, so it shouldn't be any problem having a well. I didn't know what a, what an aquifer was then, you know. So we drill a hole over there, and it's on this old little Kinsey soil, and we go down like I don't know, it's past 200 feet, and and uh, and we get this little parched water, little, you know, little trap water, like a gallon a minute, and smells like. <laughs> You know, it's like it was a dry hole. You know, basically a dry hole. You know, so that you know, so then there, so and I, my plan was is to put a, a mobile home on the place so we could live there. Well, that plan now is down the tubes, and I have to figure out something else to do. So we found an old logger's cabin that was not too far away. I actually had visual sight of the vineyard, and on King's Great Road, and I, we and the logger's cabin has the was owned by a fellow who went to the same high school I did in Fremont, in Oakland, California. Is that thing. right? Holy yeah. cow. Wow. And, and he says, Dick, you can live there. I can't get insurance on it because there's no one inside of it. I want to get fire insurance. I can't. They won't give me insurance because no one's not inhabited. So if you live in it, I can get fire insurance. And said, okay. And then, but it was a logger's cabin, 24 by 24, and it was built on four big rocks on the corner. Mm-hmm. And the whole thing was sagging into the ground like this. The, the kids, the kids were, they loved it. They got a tricycle in this corner. And they, they're going 50 miles an hour. That, time. <laughs> that, that was great fun for them. Yeah, yeah so, but didn't that affect your walking? I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the dining room table, you know, the wine glass like this. <laughs> So everything was at an angle. It's like those, uh, what do they call those, those visual um, the House of Mysteries and stuff like yeah. that, or at, at, at an angle? Yeah, they, yeah <laughs> topsy-turvy, so. Yeah. So, so then we, so we stayed there uh, for three years and until I built the house that is at the winery now. Uh-huh. And, but then that following, I planted in 1969, and, uh, and the first thing that happened was that, that all these walnut trees that we had, and there was a we uh, cleared out at the top, but there's a few down below, and and there were like it was like I don't know 20 deer or something living down in there, and and they got up one morning, and they saw all these grapevines, and they said, thank, "Thank you very much." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is well, this is this is that dining at the Ritz. You know? <laughs> We don't even have to stretch our necks or anything. <laughs> you know, they just, they're just mowing them down. You know, so what, what happens now? You know, so, so I got a, I had a neighbor down the road who was a, a World War II uh, uh, Marine, and he he had a thirty thirty with open sights on it. And he could he could you know we got a kill permit, and and I think we should, and one, that first year we we you know we shot thirteen deer that were much wow. much on the grapevines. Um, so then, that that fall, um, the uh, and what I had not known at the time was all these walnut trees I'd shoved to one side uh, had wood borers in them, and and now the wood borers they're running out of food supply because I'd shoved it, knocked over their trees. So they decided they'd attack my grapevines. Holy and they, cow! They, they let they laid eggs down the north side. The protective side of the great shoot coming up out of the shoots about this long. They would lay a series, a series of holes. It looked like a little tiny woodpecker, and they and they would lay their the wood borer eggs inside of those little holes. And and um, so that fall, that you know, November of '69, uh, we have a silver thaw, and oh so the gosh. ice, the ice, ice coats all these vines, and they snap off. Because of the weight of the ice and, uh, and the holes that the borers have made, you know. And, oh my God, you know. So anyhow, it, so then of course then you t- then you, you cut them back to the ground anyhow. So you, you two butt them, and then in the spring of 1970, we had snow on April the fourth, I think it was. Is that right? Yeah, a snowstorm comes on April the fourth, and that night um, it only left a little bit of snow. That that night it, it 
oh, the skies open up and the temperatures plummet, oh, no. and and the vines had already budded out, so they got they got frosted back to they, they were blown away. And so I said, about this time, you know, between the dry hole, the wood borers, the silver thaw, the the frost. I was ready to take the suitcase and head back to California. <laughs> yeah, it was warm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that was the worst time getting, uh, getting through that. You know, getting through that one. Right at the beginning. Yeah, because that you know that, that microclimate right next to the ground is so much tougher. It's uh, it's that inversion zone where where you get uh, the, ra the rapid cooling and and you get uh, you could have the first foot uh, when I have an open sky like that at night you could have that first foot could be like five degrees colder than the air above you, you know, where really you know, you just, huh. and then you have to that's why you want to be on a good hillside so that cold air drains down and away yeah. and keeps moving away from it yeah huh that's interesting huh so what did that what did that teach you <laughs> Don't screw with Mother Nature. Right? <laughs> yeah. and she's at me already, you know. But yeah. She's already, you know, she's laying the groundwork right now. Yeah. Saying, this is you want to you want to deal with me? You got to look for this stuff for the next forty years. So. <laughs> and these are the rules. Yeah, these are the rules. <laughs> <laughs> what about like the like the best like like an aha moment? You know, something like whoa! You know, like you had this idea and and it really worked out, or you know, just a huge success or well I think the most satisfying moment that I had I remember Bill Fuller and I was he was a winemaker at Wallen at the time uh, we were DDO he was also the owner wasn't he yeah he was part owner along with Bill Malkman two, the two Bills oh, that, okay. and that, so we were down at and uh, Domain Drew on and just completed their new winery mm. and they were showing their 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 first vintage Pinot that was actually made at Veritas, but then they moved the wine in, in, they moved the barrels into the new facility, and and, uh, and uh, Robert was there, and you know, and there, I think the whole Oregon wine industry was in this one building that, that afternoon. I mean, it would do bomb would have dropped on that building, there would have been no more Oregon wine. <laughs> so, so you know, so we're we're taking. I'm Bill and I were. Everyone's getting a, some a sample of the wine, you know, and I'm standing next to Bill and, and, they, they, and they smell it and I taste it. And I said, you know, this, I, mean, I was really relieved because this, this tastes like a good Oregon Pinot. I said to Bill, I said, this tastes like a burgundy. I'd gone outside and shot myself, you know. <laughs> 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 so it was, that was kind of confirmed. That was, that was, a, that, yeah, that was, a, that was a, yeah, that was a yeah. confirmation. That plus, you know, the experience I had in 77 of tasting the wine out of the barrels in Burgundy. Saying no, I got I got stuff that tastes like this at home, you know. Yeah. You know I'm doing the right thing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the future looks bright. The future looks good then. You know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, you know I, I keep reading, um, like in two books, um, uh, about like the Holy Grail. What 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 what's this Holy Grail stuff? Oh. And I mean, it's credited to you, so. Uh, well, there's the Holy Grail. There's the, the guy in California wrote the book called The Holy Grail or something about Pinot Noir. That's yeah. where it comes from. Uh, what's his name? It has his vineyard down in, uh, in the gold, in the, in the, up in the. Um, you can see in front of me, I can't the name of the here at the moment. No, it'll come to me. The, uh, the fellow living in Orinda, California, uh, loves Burgundy. And uh -huh. he's, he's convinced that the only way to make great burgundy is you have to have limestone soils, regardless of anything else. You have to have limestone soils. So he goes on the top of the Pacific Coast Range down there by above Monterey, uh -huh. and he finds this place in the top of the hills, uh, and he starts planting Pinot you know, up there, charting uh, like a Scandinavian name. Flying by me, couldn't latch onto it. Anyhow, um, and he he has he calls it the heartbreak the heartbreak grape. I think is the name of the book or something. Have you had seen the book? I, I've seen that book, and then there's a more recent book that um, some writer uh, wrote that um, is the Holy Grail, um, and it um, it looks at um, Lang. Uh, uh -huh. It's kind of focused on Lang, a year uh, in the vineyard or something yeah, like that. Yeah. At the and then um, in um, uh, you know the boys up north, yeah. 
um, in that book, like the Holy Grail is mentioned, you know, a, a couple times. And well, I, I mean, I, the reason I think it's called the Holy Grail is that it, it, uh, you can have a lot of bad pinots out there. I mean, when, when it doesn't get ripe or it's grown in the wrong place, it doesn't taste very good. And, and, and so the, the notion of the Holy Grail is, is that if you find the right place, do this, you get the Holy Grail. You'll have the, you'll have the inside track on making probably the world's greatest red wine. You know, some people think you know, it is by far the world's greatest red wine, as opposed to the Cabernet Bordeaux fans. You know, yeah, yeah. Being like what what's the chance that Robinson was? You know that, that uh, you know that that that. Uh, Cabernet is from here on down, and Pinot you know, from here on up. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so the cabs are, are down below the neck, and, yeah, and uh, yeah. the Pinot is above the neck. Yeah, yeah, huh. yeah. Huh, that's interesting. <laughs> well, you know, like um, like during what do you think about like during harvest? What do you think about? Yeah. Um, it's like playing chess. In, in what way? Uh, when you have uh, all these different vineyards and blocks, and it's all the different. These are all the different blocks I have and what what's growing in them. Uh huh. And so you have you have to. It's a. Uh, it's like where do we pick next, and how do we? How is this? And the, and the whole. Um, you know, when the winery wants this. You know, that's all logistics and how you, it's all going to flow. Yeah. And then what's the best time to harvest and when the flavors are getting ripe here and, and where you're going to wait there and not, you know, but we can't wait that much more over here. And, you know, the, all the, all this, it's just a, uh, it's like a big matrix of, of how all this stuff has to come together. And that's, uh, and, and it's, it's, you have all this decision making you have to do. And fortunately, Gary and I, you know, I hired Gary, the Horner, who's the winemaker at San Michel. I hired him in 03, and, and we, you know, we're pretty much on the same wave, wave, wavelength. So we we go out and taste fruit together and create a battle plan. I uh -huh. you call it a battle plan. You know, so here's, here's, and then it's subject to constant revision. You don't know what the enemy's doing. <laughs> and, and the enemy is the weather. The weather. <laughs> the yeah. weather. The birds. You know, whatever. Whatever. You know, the conditions. The, what? The, how's the fruit holding up? You know, what kind of conditions we have to work with under? You know, it's yeah. All, it all enters into the this, in, 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 into the decision. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And then, then you yeah. got like you sort of go. You sort of go. Not, I mean, you, you get so single-minded. I mean, you, should, there, you don't. You almost don't even know what day it is anymore. You know? Yeah. You know? And then logistics too. I don't know how, like how you work your crews, but I mean you've got to keep them going. And then it, because if you have to let them go or something, then they're well. The, we, fortunately, I've got um, my Hispanic foreman's been with me since over twenty years now. Since, wow! And and so uh, he can. I'll say, Mayo, I need eighty guys tomorrow. He'll get eighty guys. <laughs> I don't know how he does it. I don't. I don't ask. <laughs> 